for joining us um, for the introduction to grief, loss and bereavement. My name is Phoebe and I'm a professional development officer with the PHN. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are all meeting on today and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Jackie was supposed to be presenting tonight, however, she is not well and she has passed the honour on to Jo Baker. Jo is a specialist bereavement counsellor, support group coordinator and clinical supervisor at the Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement. Jo coordinates online bereavement support groups, trains support group facilitators, provides customised trainings and develops resources and trainings for ACGB's aged care project. We also have Jennifer from ACGB today, who will be facilitating our question Q&A session, which will be held at the end of the presentation. So during the presentation, feel free to type your questions into the question box. I have also attached a resource to this webinar. It is the Health Pathways Pathway for Bereavement, so just some extra information for you. And at the end, if you could please fill out the survey attached to this webinar, it's very important that for us to gather information about every event that we host. Okay, I will now hand over to Jo. Thank you very much, Phoebe, and welcome to everybody who's listening to this webinar today. I understand from the Hunter, New England and Central Coast regions of um, New South Wales and also anywhere you may be listening today. Um, I had the good fortune of coming up to the Central Coast a couple of months ago so and visited some of the um, aged care centres in the region, so I'm familiar with um, where you guys all are. I would like to also acknowledge that I'm presenting this webinar today on the land of the Bunurong people, which is in the Kulin Nation in Victoria. So a little bit about ACGB, um, Phoebe said a little bit there, but um, what we're doing today as part of this webinar is part of the Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement's Aged Care Project, of which I do resource development and trainings for, and webinars, um, et cetera. Um, so the learning outcomes, what we hope for you to achieve and I guess get from this webinar tonight and, and learn about is to understand and identify the impact of grief and loss and what, what it has on people, particularly uh, people within the aged care sector, <clears throat> to understand grief models and theories that inform the field of grief, loss and bereavement, and also to identify non-death related losses as we age, because we know that um, as people age and also for carers and also for aged care staff, um, there's a lot of non-death related losses that we um, experience and particularly in the wake of the pandemic as well. So this slide is um, from Rachel Remin, who, um, you know, I know that the audience today, there's a mixture of people coming from all parts or of the aged care sector or that people that work with um, older people. Um, and the expectation that we, we can be immersed by suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. And, and I think this is really important. And what this is saying is um, that we may think that, um, um, that grief and loss is not going to seep into, into our lives or when we're working with people, it may not affect us. But I think over time, when we're in a caring role and we're working with, with people a lot of the time, it does kind of seep in and having an awareness around that is really important. And this is a part, um, quite a large part of the work we do, particularly with the aged care staff at the moment. So understanding grief and loss. So what is loss? Um, loss is an experience that we all encounter throughout our lifetime. And it doesn't discriminate between you know, anyone, no matter our age, sex, race, um, where we come from, our cult culture, nas nationality. Um, there's different types of losses that we all experience and, and we will go into that into more depth, but it's really part of, of our lives and part of every day you know we experience so many different types of losses and it's something that we that we all do experience 
So some of the terminology that we use around grief and loss is grief is our normal reaction to the experience of loss. So when we lose something, whatever that may be, whether somebody has died or whether um, we start to lose our independence, and I will explain a bit more about this as we go on, um, there's so many different types of losses and um, whatever those losses are, grief is our normal and natural response to loss. And grief is something that we feel. Mourning is the process that someone goes through when we're adapting um, to the death of a person or when we're mourning something that we've lost. And mourning, so mourning is something that we do and it's an expression of our grief. And when we think about mourning, we often think about ritual, um, ceremony, um, cultural practices and traditions um, and the way that we express our grief. And bereavement is something to ha that happens to us. When we have a bereavement, that is the period after loss when the grief and the mourning occurs. And it's something that we experience, something that's really happened to us. Some different other terminology that we use is acute grief. And, and acute grief is the early response that we have to loss. And you might um, recognize this um, you may recognize this in yourself or with other people that you've been around or people whilst you're working in the aged care sector and and quite often the acute grief it's um a really specific and really kind of intense period of grief and we don't like to put time frames on it but um just really broadly and narrow, narrowly often in the first six months people can be acutely grieving it might be where emotions are really overwhelming it may be difficult for people to um, look after themselves or do their normal activities of daily living or they may ruminate with thoughts around in their mind a lot of the time and it really is it really does kind of take over and people find it quite hard to function function when they're in the acute phase of grief. And when we've integrated our grief into our lives, um, this is when we've kind of ad adapted somewhat to our loss and what has happened to us. And I guess this is the aim, like for us as bereavement counsellors or working with bereaved people or people that have experienced a lot of loss, we're, we're looking for this and, and we're, we're trying to assist people to come to this place of integration. And prolonged grief disorder is um, something that you may have heard about or um, is really seen, um, I get, well, it is a disorder and it's actually in the DSM. Um, and because we know that grief is a, a normal and natural thing um, for us to go to as human beings, but sometimes we can kind of get stuck in grief um, or we might have really pervasive kind of symptoms or still be in the acute phase of grief. And then we might be really thinking about is someone experiencing um, prolonged grief disorder where we might need to get um, some more help for them. So it's really is the, the persistence of, of acute symptoms of grief, grief. And it might be when somebody really isn't managing themselves very well um, and there hasn't been any integration or adaption to their loss over time. So the primary losses, so a primary loss is like when you drop a stone in and you get um, into some water and then you get the ripple effect. So the primary loss may be, for example, when someone has died. So example, if um, um, in a partnership, say a husband dies and a wife is left, um, the primary loss is the husband dying, and then the secondary losses are the ripple effects. So that means might mean that someone's lost their intimate partner. They may have a loss of income. They may have a loss of hopes and dreams for the future, um, loss of independence. So it's really um, important to keep this in mind that not only is there this primary loss, but the effect ripples through not only the person that the person who may be um, people close to that person, but society as well. There's this ripple effect and, it, and it's something to really be aware of so we can really watch um, and look for this in people and think about the impact that all these losses are having on people. So how does grief affect us? So we know that grief affects us in so many different ways. It affects our emotions. Um, people talk about like waves of grief coming and kind of bowling them over or having really intense, painful and, and difficult emotions like um, guilt, shame, um, anger, fear. Um, and, and it really is and can be an emotional roller coaster. Grief affects the way we think as well. And 
I'll, in another slide a bit further on, I'll explain a bit more about this and how we're all different. And for some people, we may get ruminating thoughts. We may, you know, kind of get stuck on replay with things, thinking things like, you know, um, you know, why did this happen to me? Or could I have done anything differently? Grief affects us physically. And you, you hear people talking about how they feel like their heart's being ripped out or split or that they've lost a limb. Um, because the physical effects of grief can really be so overwhelming for some people. Um, people, you know, get problems with their stomach, they might get constant headaches. And I guess, you know, as GPs and workers as well, we may kind of like miss this sometimes. And, and sometimes we might be looking for other causes for physical, the physical effects of grief, but it's so multifaceted, it's important to kind of keep all this in mind. And it affects our behaviors as well. Like some people, um, they don't want to go out anymore. They might feel really vulnerable um, when they're out and about, or they might go out all the time and try to distract themselves from their, their grief. So it affects us again, all in very different ways. And then spiritually as well, and philosophically, um, people can often change their spiritual views. Um, they, they may question, you know, why has this happened to me? What have I done to kind of deserve this? Or what, what did my um, the person who's died done to kind of deserve this? So um, we really can start to question all that. Um, and this is not only like religious view, although that is, is um, very supportive for some people. Um, also, spirituality really does um, play a part. And I will talk about a bit more about that later. And then social as well um, is a bit tied in with behaviours as well. But, um, you know, we, we, that might change for us. I mean, basically, when grief comes along, all, all the ways that we were before or all these kind of multifaceted things can change. So we might feel very insecure. You know, things are very different now. I, I don't feel myself anymore. This is the sort of thing that you'll hear people say when, when they're grieving. And this chart as well to give some examples of all the different ways that grief can affect us. And if we just have a look at, you know, a few of these, um, you will hear people say, you know, what, why am I being punished? Am I being punished for this? And that's why we might kind of listen, you know, um, to this spiritual effect that grief is having on them. Um, or, or they might be um, feeling really guilty and saying, you know, this happened because I did something or if only I'd done something differently or I should have. And these ki kinds of things that people say are something we're really listening out for a lot of the time to kind of help people make sense of what is happening to them. Some people really cry a lot and feel very overwhelmed wherever they are, but other people might keep themselves really busy and avoid um, the effects of the grief that um, they're experiencing. They might not be able to sleep. Um, they might um, want people, people might want to fix them a lot of the time or come in and say platitudes like, you know, they were old and things like that, which we know um, doesn't, you know, help people. So they might retreat socially. And basically, I think it's foreign a lot of the time, unless people have experienced um, um, grief, uh, you know, on a kind of significant level, it may, they may feel like it's quite foreign to them and they don't know who they are anymore. So I'll just go through some of the grief and loss um, theories and models that we use to inform our practice and does really help us to understand people that are grieving. And I'll try and kind of keep it to um, relating to older people, although all these are relevant for all like ages and stages within our life. So you probably have heard about the five stages of grief and these stages of grief grief were um, actually developed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, I think in 1969, actually. So it was quite a long time ago. But over time, it's been taken out of con context a little because she actually divide, devised these stages of grief for the dying person. So when people were dying, um, she recognized that people went through these stages. And even though, so denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and coming to a place of acceptance, so even, even though we really recognize the work that Elizabeth did around this, it doesn't necessarily inform our practice when we're working with bereaved people so much. Um, and when you talk to people that are bereft, they will often say, you know, I, you know, I can't get to a place of acceptance and I don't really know what that is or is there something wrong with me because I'm not, I'm not at that place yet. 
Um, and so we talk about um, grief and models and theories in a completely different way to this. Um, additionally, as well, there was um, David Kessler was um, a man whose son actually died and he added, a, he worked very closely with Elizabeth and added a sixth stage, which was meaning making, which is very much something that does inform um, us as bereavement counsellors now and something really to hold in our mind when we're working with bereaved people or even noticing that people are struggling with their grief. How do we make meaning out of what has happened to us? And I'll, we'll talk about and expand on that a bit more later. So we can see from this that actually grief isn't linear, that it doesn't really go through these linear stages, but it's actually all over the place. And, and when you talk to people um, who are grieving, they'll kind of say this as well, you know, I just, I'm all over the place. I don't kind of know where I am. Everything's sort of strange and surreal and a bit foreign. Um, so Warden, um, William Warden developed the tasks of, of mourning, which we do use a lot um, to, to help us to inform our practice when we're working as bereavement counsellors or even just working with people who have experienced any type of loss. And it's something that we just hold in our mind, you know, to think about. Um, so William Warden d devised these four tasks that he said that people go through and they're not necessarily linear and we definitely see this play out. We don't go through these tasks in a kind of order, but the task one was to accept the reality of the loss. And when we're talking about accepting the reality, that is not on a kind of cognitive intellectual level because people know um, when they've had someone close to them die that they're not here anymore, that that person has died. But on a deeper level, <coughs> excuse me, on a deeper level, they may not kind of know that because actually knowing that and accepting that is very painful. So they may sort of block that out or the brain kind of steps in to kind of numb them from the reality of actually what is happening as a kind of protective mechanism. So that's the first task. And then the second task is for people to process the pain of their grief. And that really is for people to feel the feelings of grief. And this is when people might, you know, say, you know, I, so much time has passed and I, I can now accept the person has gone, but this is harder for me now than what it was. I don't really feel numb anymore. I'm starting to really feel this. I'm so angry. I feel so guilty. If only I'd done this. Um, sorrow can kick in uh, um, or pervasive sadness and um, this can be quite a long task and, and again like flitting in throughout all the tasks because it isn't kind of we don't go through this in a kind of orderly way and then the third task is to adjust to a world without the deceased person in it anymore so I guess we're listening for this and we're um, sort of helping people to understand this for, for themselves. Um, when we're adjusting, there's three parts to this. There's the internal adjustment to loss. And that is when people start asking themselves questions like, who am I now? You know, who am I without this person with me here? Um, and then the external um, adjustment might be the more practical things like, um, you know, how do I use the washing machine? Oh, you know, I have to adjust now to paying bills. I've never had to do that. Or, um, I, you know, I have to mow the, the lawn or I have to start cooking things now. So that's that external adjustment that people go through. Um, and then there's the spiritual adjustment. So, and that's when we might sort of, you know, like challenge our own sense of self and our beliefs and assumptions about the world. Um, and quite often this is about people feeling, um, assuming that the world is safe and benevolent benevolent um, and is a good place to be and uh, a safe place to be. And now, this is kind of like having the rug pulled from underneath you, which I will talk about a little bit more. So that really challenges our beliefs and often our beliefs and values are what can keep us quite sort of stable. It's something for us to hold on to. And that's why I think sometimes it can feel so vulnerable um, and people you know, can find it so hard to adjust. And the fourth stage that Warden talked about was to find an enduring connection to the deceased in the midst of embarking on a new life. So that's finding ways to stay connected with the person who's died. Um, 
and using often the, the concept of continuing bonds, which I will talk about a bit more as well. Um, so how do we embrace new experiences and how do we continue living whilst going through this grief and all the adjustment and all the feelings that come up um, whilst we're grieving? And William Warden also came up with the medias of eighters of mourning, mourning, which are really important to think about because they go along with the tasks and it's something we're really listening out for and making note of um, and can really show us how people are adapting to loss over time. And the mediators are really kind of like um, looking at what's happened, how it happened, how has the person coped. So the first mediator was kinship. So, you know, we want to know who, who's died, how significant were they to you? How close were they to you? What was your relationship with that person? Um, and all being, you know, if a companion animal as well. Um, and, and the second one is the nature of a, the attachment to the person who's died. How secure was that attachment? Um, how, how can you function now without that person? Is that impacting on your grief? And is it making it harder for you to go through that adjustment in the task, the third task that we talked about before? How the person's died has, has a really big impact. Was it a sudden death? Was it expected? Um, was there trauma? Was it a traumatic death? Um, so we're really kind of interested in how the person died um, as well. Historical incidents, that's really looking at um, what's happened in the past. What, what adversity have people had to go through and how have they managed it? Um, you know, how have we got through tough times in the past? Um, that might also be um, historical losses as well. How many losses has a person experienced? Are they accumulating? Um, how does that really help you to, to adjust to your loss now? Personality variables also play a part so that, you know, we kind of talk about um, or listening for whether people might have an optimistic or a pessimistic worldview, the way they view the world. And we know that this can all be shaken around and changed when somebody's grieving. But, you know, I guess we're looking for those traits. We might be looking for how resilient somebody is. Um, and socially, what sort of support networks do they have around them? Are they able to ask for help? Are they able to access resources to help them? Um, you know, what does that look like for people? And then concurrent losses and stressors as well. So what else is going on beside this kind of like primary loss? There may be other things as well, or multiple losses um, that are accumulating or other stressors like, which can come about from the secondary losses I talked about, you know, now, um, I'm under financial stress or now I need to move house or maybe now I need to move into residential aged care and there's so much loss around that I kind of don't know where to kind of start in adapting to this. So all these things kind of play out with the tasks of mourning. And the dual process model some people may have heard about before. This is a really key concept um, in bereavement and when we're working um, with people who are experiencing loss. So. Um, <clears throat> A dual process model is really looking at everyday life experience. And if we think about it with two kind of like circles or island, we look at like one circle as being loss or grief and loss orientated and the other circle being life or what we call restoration orientated. And what we want, what we want to see and what we're kind of listening for or helping people to um, do is to oscillate or move from one of these circles into the other circle. Um, and when you are aware of this, you can really notice it all the time with people who are grieving. So I guess like if we think of the loss orientated circle as um, really the grief work, it might be really sitting with the pain and the sorrow of our grief and the difficulties that we're feeling around and the challenges of grief. It might be the intru intrusion of our grief kind of being very overwhelming for some people or you know we can really be ruminating a lot about it and not sleeping and all the, all those things that happen when we're um, really um, with our grief I guess so there's that part of it but then there's also the restoration or life circle which is attending to what we need to do to make life work for us and that might be doing new things that might be distracting ourselves from our grief because we know we need to get things done um, or avoidance or denying our grief because of 
what we talked about earlier that it's just too painful for us to kind of be with and feel so we might try to avoid that as much as we can and it might be taking on new roles and identities and relationships I guess that sort of ties in with warden's task when we're looking at um, <clears throat> external adaptation as well what is new and what is different and I think really like what we know for the healthy adaptation and integration of grief is that we want to move from one to the other. So I often think about when people say, you know, I just I'm going straight back to work. I just, you know, I don't want to I'm just not thinking about it. I'm kind of like just getting on with it, you know, shoulders back and let's get on with it. They may be in life orientation, but we know that over time that may not be a healthy way to grieve just as much so as say staying in bed a lot of the time, never getting up, never attending to what we need to do to make life work as well. So when we sort of say this to people, they can recognize it, that we're looking for that movement and it helps to normalize um, this for people that, oh, okay, it's kind of okay for me to maybe just be with my grief and feel overwhelmed with it for a little while. And then how do I kind of pick myself up and go to cooking dinner? Um, and we're really trying to help people to be able to do that with an awareness around it so they're not dragging themselves kind of from one circle to the other, which is really exhausting for people. And this is hard work as well for people, but it's trying to bring it into their awareness. Um, and so Lois Tonkin um, came up with a different um, concept about grief, the growing around grief concept. Um, and Lois um, Tonkin was a bereaved mother who found that when um, people were talking about the stages of grief, uh, that, that that when she came to acceptance, that was an example that she kind of thought, you know, what what is this? I, I, I don't even know if this is, um, you know, okay or how it should be in grief. And she came up um, with this model. So this model really represents that grief doesn't go away necessarily and we're not trying to get it to go away because it's part of who we are and part of our connection to the person who's died. So the grief is there if you think of it like that circle on the left and then it will never entirely disappear but we can our life can expand around our grief and this normalizes for people as well that it's okay to still be grieving or um, that they may still get overwhelmed by their grief, particularly um, at significant times or anniversaries around the death of someone and birthdays. And they may really think, what's wrong with me? Um, I'm still like this many, many years down the track. Um, but we know that that's quite a normal thing. Um, so the grief is still there, but our life can expand and grow around it. And then over time, it still stays the same, but our life really expands. And that might be looking at people's social networks, um, new roles that they take on in the life orientation, um, new friendships, new work, new, I guess, new ways of viewing the world um, or belief systems and things like this. So it does take time, but it's quite... Um, it can be, I guess, um, has been described as quite seductive in a way, but also quite comforting for people to think they don't have to kind of get on with it or come to a place where their grief is going to stop. And then um, I guess they're going to feel like they did before, because we know that when we experience such significant losses, that um, things are always going to be different for us. And part of this is having a look, helping people to think about what does that look like for me? So the continuing bonds I did touch on a bit before as well, um, which kind of ties in a bit with finding an enduring connection with Warden's um, fourth task. So this really means that um, the person is no longer with us physically, but we can still have a connection with the person who's died. So how do we find ways to redefine this relationship with the deceased, allowing for a bond to continue with them? And this means different things to different people. Um, um, but some examples of this might be planting a tree um, or having a memorial. Um, it might be when you hear people saying um, that they talk, they talk to photos or they talk to the deceased person and they can feel that connection to them or they might tell them about what their day is like. Um, and you may you know, find this um, when you're working with older, older people in aged care homes or in the community that you know, people will keep photos close to them and dear to them. They may talk to them, they may kiss them when they go to bed at night. Hmm. 
Another example of a continuing bond, it would be um, a hello again letter, which is on this slide, and or journaling. So really writing down our thoughts and feelings and talking um, to our person and asking, you know, saying things like what's on this. Um, you taught what you taught me about life is. Um, what I want you to know about how I am is. Um, I want to keep you in my life by and helping people to really come up with ways that are meaningful to them and personal to them. Um, it can also be asking for forgiveness. You know, I wish if I had my time again, I would have done something differently. I wish I said this. And so we can't actually say that to the person now, but we can kind of get it out of our heads and our hearts and put it onto paper. So there are ways that we can kind of help facilitate this for people to help keep that um, relationship and the bond there with them. Um, a meaning reconstruction, um, as I touched on before, um, this is from um, Bob Niemeyer, who has done a lot of work on meaning reconstruction. And this is really, like I guess, like challenging and getting people to think about their beliefs, their values, their assumptions, and what that means for them, like now going through this such a significant um, loss for them in their life and how things have changed so much. Um, and I guess um, it can be a little bit like, say, a vase going, falling to the ground and shattering into pieces like in this picture. And this is the Japanese art of Kintsugi, which is where something shattered and they put the pieces back together with gold um, kind of glue, um, which symbolizes that life could actually, even though it's different, it could be better and we could make it more meaningful if we can kind of go through this process. So we want to help people to kind of put back those pieces together. It might be helping them to kind of examine their shattered assumptions about um, how they thought the world would be or how how um, the significant person in their life died and they might have thought it'd be different. You, you hear people saying this was not how it was meant to be. You know, this is never how I thought it would be. So meaning construction is a big part of our work. And I think something for us to kind of hold in mind when we're working with older people or anybody who's experiencing grief and loss to help them put those pieces back together and think about for them what is meaningful in their in their life now. Uh, grieving styles is a really important um, model um, as well, or theory around um, grieving. And this is something that I think that we can all think about. And when we do kind of workshops and we're all together, we do do some sort of experiential activities around this to help people figure out, you know, how do I grieve? So the intuitive style of grieving um, is very much feeling through our grief. It can be quite emotive, affective, um, and often intuitive style grievers manage their feelings well. They might express their feelings well. Um, and an instrumental um, style of griever may be more cognitive in their approach. They may think through their grief. They may be more solitary or problem solve more. And they can be often quite sort of good at managing their thoughts and cognitions. The reality is um, that I think everybody's kind of on a continuum here, or it's blended, and a lot of people are blended with parts of this. But it, it is an interesting thing to kind of think about because I think um, it people feel often misunderstood with their grief, and this is the reason why sometimes um, intuitive style grievers will think that instrumental style grievers don't care. Um, and instrumental grievers will think that intuitive style grievers are not coping well. That's just a generalization, but it helps us understand how we're all different and that it's not one is not necessarily um, better or than the other. It's just really different in how we sort of manage our grief. Um, and and sometimes we can be misunderstood in this way. Um, an example of that would be um, like Rosie Batty um, when she um, was when she first was grieving the death of her son. Um, which was in Victoria, um, her son died and she was very much in the media um, portrayed as not really caring or quite sort of hard and stoic when in fact she was actually displaying being an instrumental griever and then she came out later and kind of said after she became Australian of the Year, <clears throat> excuse me, that she said now she was going to start like the more intuitive way of grieving when she kind of really fought um, to make changes. Um, so I guess that kind of like shows how we can be misunderstood sometimes. 
um, and leading on from being misunderstood um, with disenfranchised grief is something uh, um, that a lot of people do experience and this is when a person experiences a lot a loss that cannot be openly acknowledged that we may not be able to be publicly mourn a loss or we're not supported socially and some examples of that and this can make it very hard for people to feel understood and heard um, and or to get the right support they may not feel worthy of grieving um, in, when their grief is disenfranchised. So it's really important for us to be mindful of this. And some examples of that might be um, when a companion animal dies. I mean, I, I, as an example, maybe for an older person going into aged care, they have to relinquish a companion animal. That would be a loss. But, you know, it may be kind of not always understood um, or um, in a same-sex partner, partnership that may have been um, kept in secret or um, maybe sometimes people are not allowed to go and publicly mourn in these cases that their grief may be disenfranchised. Uh, and I think a lot of the losses that I'll go into in a minute, the non-death related losses are also disenfranchised because we can't always recognize them, we can't always see them. For example, like um, loss of safety or loss of independence um, and many other things that we can't always see, they're not always tangible. Um, and so I put this slide in as well, just to think about grief and aging. Um, <clears throat> And that older people have very likely experienced many varied losses, and that can bring wisdom, but we don't always want to presume resilience <clears throat> because accumulated losses are over throughout life can affect a person in different ways. Um, I think a lot of older people are resilient, but we really don't want to assume that. We really need to think about um, our own assumptions around older people and aging as well when we're thinking about how resilient people are. <clears throat> and we can ask um, people questions like, what has helped you in the past? When people have wisdom and life experience, they have no doubt um, experienced adversity in the past. And it's good to help them to get thinking about what, what helped me in that situation? How did I get through that? Or what have I still got in my life to feel grateful for now? So the non-death loss losses, um, non-death related losses, or also called living losses, are a loss of things we value that provide us with a sense of safety. And some examples are loss of roles, um, and these are some non-death related losses we may experience as we age. Loss of independence, um, loss of place, um, loss of dignity, Loss of, loss of personhood, or we can, we may feel invisible as well. Um, and I think as we get older, we're more likely, our health may um, likely decline, um, that there, all these losses, you know, kind of really play out for people in so many ways. And there's many different types of non-death related losses. The tangible losses, as I talked about, the ones we can really see and we can really know that might be moving into residential aged care, um, that might be when somebody dies. Um, the intangible losses are, are less easy to recognize and it is these kind of non-death related losses um, that we just looked at there. Um, I think a loss of a sense of safety is a really big one and loss of freedoms for people, particularly if they may be in aged care. It may not be able, easy to get about or get out or to do the things that we normally did. Um, and non-finite loss is really categorised um, by ongoing kind of persistent losses that have no foreseeable end. Um, that might be someone who's caring for somebody with dementia. Um, you know, you may not be able to see when this is going to end. How, how long is, is this loss going to go on? And it can be very difficult um, for people to kind of live with this over a long period of time. And we also know that non-finite loss, loss that we can't see an end for, can lead to chronic sorrow over time. And we have you know, seen this during the pandemic as um, as well is that these persistent non-finite losses lead to chronic sorrow which is the kind of pervasive and persistent symptoms of grief and it might be like the acute grief um, or just and it can really manifest a bit like depression but it's also a bit different there um, and then there's ambiguous loss so ambiguous loss is um, 
it's very hard for people to make sense of because it's a loss that doesn't really have any closure um, or we may not know what has happened and when it's going to happen. And some examples of that are when someone is physically present but um, psychologically not present. And an example of that would be with someone who is experiencing dementia of different types. So they're physically there, but they're psychologically not present so much now, or there's a decline with that. And very hard for people to make sense of that. And then there's also um, the physical, um, when people are psychologically present, but not um, physically present. And that might be when somebody is, is a missing person or during wartime, when um, they're psychologically with us still, but they're physically, there may not be a body or anything to kind of help us understand what's happened to someone. So ambiguity in loss is um, is something that's, that's difficult. And we really want to recognise that in people to help them work through that. And then with anticipatory grief, um, there's a few hallmarks marks for anticipatory grief. And this is, you know, um, could be when someone, we know somebody is going to die, they might have a life limiting illness or when there is dementia as well, um, that, you know, the grief can, it can be non-finite and can be really ongoing and can take its toll. And the hallmarks of anticipatory grief is that it's a roller of uncertainty for people. And there's a white elephant in the room. There's often people don't want to talk about it. You know, we don't we don't want to kind of really acknowledge what is going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. Um, and that anticipatory grief is uh, the rehearsal is not the same as the main act, really meaning that it's very hard for us to pre prepare. We can feel like we're preparing for someone to die, but we really don't know what it's going to be like. And there's can be a lot of anxiety around that. We don't we can't really know what's going to happen. Um, and with an anticipatory grief, there's three things we're looking at, and that's the past, and that's what informs people within their grief. And then um, there's the present, which is how am I living now? How, what am I living with now? And how can I keep living with this kind of often uncertainty? And then for the future, the anticipation of what's going to happen, which is really particularly so hard for people. And I think with older people, their past informs a lot of this as well, thinking about how they got through things in the time and living through uncertainty. You know, some people, they would have lived through wartime and a lot of difficulty. Um, and it really does inform um, with anticipatory grief. So what can we do about anticipatory grief and loss? Um, and even with all the non-death related losses that I've talked about and grief and loss in the whole, um, we can monitor our own attitudes. I think as people um, age, you know, there, there can be some ageist attitudes, I suppose. Um, and I wonder about that sometimes because, you know, we're all aging every day. We're all getting old. And sometimes some of this is like our own stuff that might come up and show up in our interactions to people. So sometimes it's really important to think about what does that mean for me as well? And that, you know, an older person isn't just kind of an entity on their own, that it changes, it evolves, that we're all human beings and that we're all kind of on this journey through different life stages. We don't want to kind of lump, I guess, older people into their own baskets. We want to kind of challenge our own assumptions, as I just said, about ageing and what that means to us. Um, you know, sometimes in the media as well, um, there's a lot comes up that it can inform us or kind of sitting back and thinking about what that's really like and what it's like for people um, as, as they age and also for carers and family and staff um, that are all working with older people. Um, we want to be really inclusive and we and also to be critically aware of what is going on for people so we can really help them and just be kind of present and with them. And so, you know, when we think about what most grieving people want from another person, they really want a witness to what they're experiencing. They want support and they and they want to be heard uh, and they want to be respected. And sometimes they want people to accompany, accompany them through their grief. Not everybody wants that, but sometimes people do and it can be really helpful, whether that's friends or family, social support. You can't kind of underestimate neighbours and, and people and like contacts that people have. Um, and sometimes that might be professional support as well. Um, they want everybody really wants validation of their feelings um, when they're grieving 
um, they want to feel like they're okay, that they're normal and that, you know, that we can normalise what they're experiencing. And now having some knowledge around it, we may be able to do that more. And we want to kind of really hone in and reflect on how people cope and what solutions they've had in the past. Um, I'll kind of really look at their inner strengths to, to help them um, to manage. So how can we help people um, in, later in, in life if they're grieving? We want to assess their sh social support. We want to encourage self-determination and independence. You know, how much of uh, things can they do for themselves? If we think about that kind of life or restoration circle, you know, what, what can they do to feel self-determined and to do things they need to do to make life work for them still? And what do they need like a hand with? And we want to look at protective pack factors you know people may use prayer and that's protective for them um, art or music any way that they can express their grief um, in any way that's creative and we want to make sure they feel like connection and that may be connection to the person who's died but that also might be connection to themselves what helps them or connection to the world by thinking about their worldview um, and what that means to them and reminiscence therapy is is particularly useful with older people. You know, I think we've probably all sat with um, older people and younger people throughout time and just sitting, really listening, helping them to reminisce and go back through time is really helpful to help remember, feel connected, think about what helped them previously. Um, and the rituals come out in the story when we're rem reminiscing or talking to older people. What rituals support them? And, you know, that might be having a cup of tea um, every morning or making, um, you know, a phone call or checking in with someone every day. Those kind of rituals that can kind of um, provide us with some stability in amongst all these things that we feel we've got no control over. Um, <coughs> so excuse me so the rituals they really do come out in the story when you listen to people and we want to and this ties in with self-determination and independence we want to give them a sense of purpose and mastery over what they can still master and a sense of identity you know what purpose do they have now and that might be getting involved with um, activities and different things or talking about their role when worked or you know what's been helpful for them and we can really help people by being kind and Carl Rogers core conditions are when we really listen and empathize with people and we're truly kind of there with them. Um, it can be, you know, it's not always kind of really big sort of therapies that we're using in bereavement It's often like sitting and listening and being present with people and you can't underestimate that. And then um, often with end of life care, um, dignity, dignity therapy, um, which is a specific type of therapy, um, can be used effectively. So um, human kindness, this is the last slide um, for us to just think about. We each have gifts and limits that are a normal part of being human, and they both need to be acknowledged and honored. And we need to be careful um, that we don't devalue or we don't kind of like jump in to think about what can we do to help someone that often being present um, with them, as I said, kind of, you know, empathizing, taking the time to listen to people when we can. Um, we have workloads and everything that we need to do, but we can just do have moments of being present with people as well that really makes people um, feel heard, understood and respected. And um, at the end of the day, the main thing is that people want their grief to be witnessed, no matter kind of what sort of loss they've experienced. Um, so, yeah, thank you. There's some resources here. Um, thank you. And I wonder if there's any questions or anything I can um, fill some gaps in for you. So, yes. thank you, Jo. Um, we didn't, the only had, question that we had was about whether or not um, this session was being recorded. Um, it is mm -hmm. being recorded and it will be available on our website, on the PHN website in the um, education library. Um, oh. We have had another question come through, so I will throw over Je to Jennifer. Um, everyone, if you have a question, please, please put it up now so that Joe can answer it for you. 
Thanks, Phoebe. Joe, I have a question here from Alicia. A mental health nurse once said to me that a lot of depression is rooted in grief. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, well, depression can kind of um, present quite similarly to grief. There are some really key differences, though, um, in that often depression it can be a real berating of self. Um, that's one of the things, and there can be often quite a hopelessness and um, helplessness with um, people who are depressed. It can be quite difficult sometimes because, but it is quite different. Um, it can be particularly quite difficult as well when someone is experiencing kind of symptoms of prolonged grief disorder, which I talked about, because that, that again can be quite similar. But grief is often a bit more sort of temporary. So someone might feel kind of really overwhelmed one minute and feel like, you know, I I don't know where to turn um, um, or have suicidal ideation around, you know, this kind of really difficult, painful emotion they're having. But I think often with grief, it kind of, you know, it passes a lot of the time. With depression, it can be more pervasive and people can feel quite helpless. Um, so there are some quite key differences, but it is different. Does that answer? Okay. Did I, um, Alicia did just um, clarify that she did mean unresolved grief within that yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of depression can stem from unresolved grief. Yeah. Like, I think, like, unresolved is um, like I know exactly what you mean so it's my, kind of like people that might be stuck and, and able to adapt or integrate the loss into their lives which is just the terminology that we probably use but same thing um, so um, yeah like it can present quite similarly and because prolonged grief disorder is in the DSM-5 which is you know the the manual for mental health kind of conditions and disorders but you know grief is not grief is a, a normal natural thing that everybody will experience to different levels throughout their life. But prolonged grief disorder is often formed by, informed by other things as well, like other factors or mediators, like a past history of mental ill health, um, the way that somebody died, and sometimes when there's more traumatic death and things like that. So I think you wanna look at the big picture, but if you're unsure about that, you wanna get, um, really make sure someone's got the right support um, and if a person goes to the GP that GPs are really informed about those differences as well so that they can I guess sort of like diagnose or or make sure a person is supported in the right way it is um, it is a bit similar but I said often this kind of real berating of self that goes on and on and on can be a di different to someone who's um, maybe sort of kind of stuck in their grief um, may kind of flit in and out of that if you know what I mean they might come guilt might be really overwhelming but then it might subside um, whereas I think with um, depression that really stays around a lot of the time does that make sense I have a question here Joe. how do you think the pandemic has impacted grief and loss for older people Oh, look, I think it's had such a huge impact and probably the people listening here that work with older people as well would be able to say, you know, just even better than me. But I think, you know, what we've noticed is that um, there's been, I think, a lot more uh, the chronic sorrow, like these um, non-finite losses, not, they're not being any foreseeable end to this, you know, it's still going on. And throughout all the lockdowns when people couldn't see their family or their normal support networks weren't there, that they're kind of calling it, calling it a chronic social condition, the COVID-19 chronic social condition, which is, you know, the kind of this ongoing pervasive sorrow that people are, and uncertainty, the roller coaster of uncertainty that people are expecting. So I, you know, I think and along with that also, the majority of the deaths in Australia have been in aged care. And, and I think for everybody, dealing with this, you know, the people living in there, people visiting or not being able to visit, the, the aged care workers that, that are going in in really difficult conditions, um, supporting everyone, and then going back to their families, worried, am I going to spread it around? And am I going to get it? And I kind of, you know, all this kind of things had a massive effect on the aged care sector as a whole. 
Thank you. Uh, just another question here. What can we do to help people who are experiencing anticipatory loss? Oh, okay, so um, uh, those three parts of anticipatory loss I talked about, the past, how that informs sort of how we cope and what happened to us and the future, what is like life like for me now, and then anticipating, sorry, that's the present, then anticipating what the future is going to be like. I think it's really key to kind of tap into people's coping, kind of ways of coping and managing, but also that one hallmark that is a roller coaster kind of uncertainty that with anticipatory grief, I think there's a quite a lot of anxiety around that as well. And so Certainty really creates anxiety, not for everybody, but you know, like how do we kind of tolerate and manage this persistent kind of not knowing what is going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to be. Um, so I think if someone is experiencing anticipatory um, grief, it can be for quite a long period of time, it will kind of, you know, seep in and pervade sometimes it's really important that they do get I think professional support and that the people around them have awareness of it and it might be you know I, I guess what springs to mind with anticipatory grief is people caring for people with dementia what can they do can they have time out can they have respite what does that look like getting them the right resources maybe through dementia australia if possible um you know doing shifts with people making sure they maintain some sort of rituals and stability in their world as well um and you know managing kind of this sort of persistent um, uncertainty. Thank you, Joan. There's, there's a question here from Magali. Who would be the best person or centre to reach out to that could develop a list of who to contact and what to do as soon as a loved one passes away in order to reduce their sense of hopelessness or overwhelm? Yeah, okay. So are you are you meaning like sort of practical things that, that the family need to do when they're really kind of acutely grieving in those early stages? Is that like, you know, sort of practical things they need to do, are you thinking, or emotional? Yes, um, that, yes that would be my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so we do have some of those things. Like, um, I think having a list like... Um, of what to do where I think look it's very hard isn't it for people to really kind of think about what they need to do there's usually someone in a family that kind of steps up and takes over to do all these things that need to do but yeah like to have to have a list would be so helpful um, for everybody to go through because you, we can't think clearly as well um, so look I, to be honest I'm not really sure um, there's um, certain things um, that you can do. There is a bereavement register um, that you can register for. I know that um, they will kind of stop post and things like that and what to do with online accounts and things like that for people as well. There's certain organisations like that that will step in and help. Um, a list is a really good thing to have but I, to be honest with you I don't we we don't really have that probably because we're providing more emotional psychological support for people but it'll be a great thing to start in your organization um yeah things like where what you need to do what you need to do with a solicitor wills probate all those things shutting down electricity accounts all those things that people need to do the practical stuff that it's very hard to think clearly about mm -hmm. one last question joe from Tabitha. In an ideal world, what would you recommend to support residents in aged care with all types of grief? Um, residents in aged care. Um, I, I, I just think when you're supporting somebody who is grieving, no matter who it is, it's actually being present. Now, Look, I know I used to work in aged care. Um, I've got a nursing background um, many years ago, but the reality is there's the big workload to get through. And I know that. But I think you can make a real difference to people by just sitting, even if it's for a short time, that the time you are with them, that you're truly present with them and using Roger's core conditions of empathy, um, which is which is really kind of trying to put yourself in someone's shoes. Um, or believing what their experience is like for them um, rather than sympathizing which is really kind of trying to kind of like fix it and move on more um, and then 
um, unconditional positive regard, which is really kind of no matter what you tell me, I'm going to I'm not going to judge you like judgment will always come up for us. But how do we kind of sit with that and not that let that interfere? You know, I'm going to put that aside. And I'm going to listen to you witnessing people's grief is what people want like on that slide what do grieving people want they want to be heard and they want to be understood and respected so I actually think you don't need kind of like big interventions the models and theories that I've talked about it really informs us it helps us, us to think about whether people are adapting to loss or integrating it into their life throughout time which is which is important because if they're not then we might need to look at other supports um, but you can't underestimate being kind and listening effectively um, with people within the time that you have. Thank you, Joe. That uh, comes to the end of our questions that we have tonight. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your questions. They were great. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I know 6.30 to 7.30 is prime family time, prime dinner time. So thank you a lot. Um, thank you to AC, GB and Joe and Jennifer. Um, great presentation, um, really, really helpful um, and, you know, something that everyone can relate to. So thank you. Um, if thank everyone you. can just um, please fill out your um, evaluations when you get them. Um, and once again, the slides that have been presented and the recording of this will go up on the PHN website, okay? All right, well, everyone have a good night and thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.